and show that what they are, those claims, are simply expressions of a will to power. That people underneath those uh, veneers of objectivity, underneath those claims to objectivity and truth and justice and morality, we can find simply expressions of uh, ordinary power relations. So an, an obvious um, reply to postmodern readers or interpreters like that um, is to ask about the status of their own theories or the status of Nietzsche's theory. After all, isn't it being presented as truth? Isn't it being presented as a kind of uh, accurate view? Uh, and can't the debunking project get applied to that theory itself? Isn't it only an expression of Nietzsche's will to power or their own? Now, the postmodernists that I just alluded to before are quite aware of this challenge, and typically they embrace it. Um, they embrace the sort of reductio on their own view. So they insist that interpretation also is indeterminate, and there's no big, no, no objective basis, or no rational basis for choosing among different interpretations, including theirs. Everything, including their own interpretation, is merely rhetoric in the service of power. Um, and here they come back to Nietzsche as supposedly, uh, supposedly exemplifying this uncovering of the will to power under the claims of morality. So he isn't, they say, proposing the truth of his theory. He's not proposing any kind of um, positive values to replace morality. He's simply engaged in a process of deconstruction, simply engaged in a process of showing that the claims to truth or claims to objectivity or claims to justice or claims to morality um, are focused. Okay. Um, so I think that this interpretation is mistaken also. Um, I'm not going to be able to develop the reasons why until we actually look at some texts. Um, but through, uh, I'll just mention three very brief points. First, uh, throughout his writings, Nietzsche um, consistently praises certain virtues, including especially the virtue of honesty. So I'll come back to this later on, but this is something that he consistently, often extravagantly, praises. Second, um, the interpretation that I just sketched out here um, either collapses into, or already is, or is very close to a certain kind of nihilism, a certain kind of view that um, is skeptical with regard to all values. And as we'll see, nihilism is something also that Nietzsche was, tried to resist and fight against also throughout his Finally, um, one other thing I'll come back to at the end today, maybe the beginning next time, is this idea of the will to the power, the, the thing, not the book. Um, and there are two different interpret, basically, two different interpretations of how to understand this. Um, one is as a kind of psychological doctrine about human beings. The other is a kind of metaphysical doctrine about the way the world is. So I'll come back to that also. And I think that this postmodern interpretation gets that wrong. Okay. Um, 
So this was all about um, his sort of writing style and the interpretation of, of his work. Let me say this, it's really easy to be dazzled by his writing. Um, and part of the effect on the reader of being dazzled is to lose sight of the fact that Nietzsche's topics, the things that he's writing about, are often, usually in fact, um, mainstream problems in philosophy. He's addressing exactly the same problems that um, he sees, or exactly the same problems that he sees in Kant's writing and in Schopenhauer's metaphysics. Um, now the answer, answers that he gives to these questions, to these mainstream philosophical problems, are often unusual. Um, so in many works, he calls himself an immoralist for example. So that's unusual. We don't have uh, many philosophers saying that they're opposed to morality. Um, uh, but what's interesting isn't just sort of the conclusion that he reaches with regard to these mainstream philosophical problems. Uh, he gives reasons. Uh, he gives an analysis of the problem and why he gives the answers that so here's my warning to you. Um, don't go jumping to conclusions about what he's for or against too quickly. Um, what we need to do is carefully and slowly piece together how he understands a certain problem before we can see how he is going to evaluate it. Um, his evaluations are not always what they seem because his analysis of how to understand things like morality is often different. So the point is that um, when you are reading, um, you need to discipline. You need to work hard and maintain your focus and concentration. Um, and I want to say something more about this. Um, what I want to say is that reading Nietzsche is hard, but it's hard for exactly the opposite re reason that reading Kant is hard. So reading Kant is hard, reading Kant is, is difficult, because the arguments and discussion is writ for Kant is in very abstract technical vocabulary, and um, how can I put this? Some people find it dry. Um, Nietzsche is exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. So you need to force yourself to concentrate. Remember, um, remember what it is that he's trying to answer, and not let yourself get carried away with his rhetoric. Um, the excitement and over-the-top rhetoric that Nietzsche uses is absolutely deliberate. Um, um, he's, he's presenting his view in this way on purpose. Um, and he's expecting you to get carried away. But then he's also expecting you to discipline yourself, to reflect back on what he's saying, and to bring it back to the down road. In fact, he, he says this explicitly. So near the end of his life, he wrote a book called Ecce Homo, which is a sort of intellectual biography, reflecting back on his earlier works. And he says this about the genealogy in particular. He says that each of the essays in the genealogy, there are three parts, each has a beginning, he says, which is, quote, calculated to mislead. Each has a beginning, which is calculated to mislead. A middle wherein, he says, eventually a tempo froce is attained, in which everything rushes ahead in tremendous tension. And each has an end, 
in which a new truth becomes visible. Okay, so the kind of over-the-top rhetoric and the kind of destruction and claiming to be an immoralist is fun, but you're not getting his point if you're just letting yourself be swept along. Uh, you're not reflecting on what he's trying to say and what kind of reaction he's trying to provoke in you. Um, so he's critical, let me put this one, he's critical of the self-indulgence that readers allow themselves if they only go along with the bombastic over-the-top rhetoric. In other words, he wants you to have, first of all, the reaction of being swept away. But then he also wants you to go back over the text and read it patiently and carefully and think about why it was that he was able to elicit that reaction. Um, it turns out that he's often saying something other than what the initial cause of your um, initial reaction. Um, so, despite the fun, I'm imploring you to treat him like a serious philosopher and study the text just as you would with Hobbes or Kant. So, occasionally, so th this means two things. One is uh, you need to be much more careful in choosing secondary literature for paper on each um, Because much of the secondary literature is not disciplined in the way that he wants. And second, um, I occasionally will get a paper from a student that tries to imitate Nietzsche's style. Um, occasionally I'll get a paper that says things like, um, Nietzsche's philosophy reveals the absurdity of life and explains why he had to go insane. Um, I'm not happy when I get that kind of paper. All right, so let me go over something about his life. Um, I'll talk about, some, just say a few things about um, his work. He was born um, in um, a small provincial village um, in Saxony. It's now part of um, Germany, it's part of Prussia. Um, in 1844, his father was uh, the Lutheran minister of the small village. Um, he, his father, was the grand, sorry, Mitchu was the son of the village minister. He was the grandson of um, um, uh, what's called a superintendent in the Lutheran Church of the like equivalent of a bishop. Um, his mother was the daughter of the minister in the next town over. Um, his father went insane when Nietzsche was just four. Um, most experts think that Nietzsche's later insanity was not related. His father. Um, his family, after his father um, um, went insane, his family moved um, to another town um, where he lived his childhood. In 1848, um, age 14, he went to a boarding school on a scholarship. He studied and did very well in theology, literature, and music, but especially was interested in concentrated on classics, so classic Greek literature. In 1864, um, he graduated, so he's 20 years old. He went to uh, the University of Bonn. While he was there, his first year there, he joined a fraternity, and according to Kaufman, um, quote, soon found himself revolted by its lack of fraternity, his lack of sophistication, and the very unclassical, beer-drinking patriotism of his fraternity brothers. He made a quixotic attempt to raise their level to his own.